certain things. In order to be a member here, one must demonstrate a credible confession of faith in Christ as having been saved by his grace through faith. One must say, I am in substantial, non-divisive agreement with the doctrines, what we believe, with the direction, how we challenge one another to live the life and where we believe God would have us go in mission and ministry uh, for the gospel's sake, and in discipline, the disciplines, the formal disciplines. But I believe there's a place to be taught, to teach one another. So we do that in Sunday school. We do that in morning worship. We do that in evening worship. We do that in prayer meeting. I believe these things. We further discuss that discipline is not only formative, that is instructive, where we're either being taught or we're teaching one another. It's corrective. We recognize that once we're saved by grace through faith, we're not put into a bubble and delivered from the possibility of sin. We all struggle with remaining sin. We pray that we will use the means of grace in a sanctifying way so that we will grow thereby. If this sounds like our covenant, uh, it's taken from that. But we also recognize that we're frail creatures of dust and any one of us at any time are subject to to being taken captive by the devil to do his will. And it's at that point that we ask ourselves, do we really love one another? It's easy to bury your head in the sand. And in the name of love, do nothing. When someone, a member, who has expressed everything I've just expressed to you in order to join here, takes up scandalous living, And yet I submit to you that's not love on our part if we bury our heads in the sand. So today we're looking at the third and final installment on this topic, the role of redemptive, corrective discipline in the church. I've taught you. We've done this before, straight from the Scriptures, but I've taught you this time not only from the Scriptures, but but line by line from our bylaws on the subject of church discipline. Just to remind you what you read, remind you what you agreed to when you joined this church, what this individual agreed to when she joined this church. And so today we're going to look at the final consideration of this next Sunday, Lord willing. Uh, I would love to think that this week there will be a, a deep work of repentance on her part and she would cry out, Uh, to God and want to be helped by us and we would put all of this on hold. But failing in that, next Sunday we will take a vote as a congregation to excommunicate this individual who has for some time been reached out to by various members and has to this point spurned every effort to call her to repentance. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 13. You should be very familiar with that passage by now if you've been hanging with us the last several Sundays, just as you should be very familiar with Matthew 18, 1 to 20, which we've read together the last several Sundays. But that's good. These passages need to be in your mind and in your heart. Stand with me if you would. Follow along as I read 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 13. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. 
not at all meaning the sexually immoral of the world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother or sister. If he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater or a reviler, a drunkard, a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And it is sufficient to tell us how we should conduct ourselves personally, pursuing holiness because He who called us is holy. And it tells us how we ought to function corporately as a body when, when there is a flagrant uh, ignoring of that call to holiness. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, by now you should be familiar. I hope you're, if you were not familiar with the categories, formative and corrective, I hope by now you are. I've suggested to you, and you can look at this anywhere in life, by the way. These are, these are divine, eternal principles. In a home, parents who take seriously the challenge of, of instructing children, they don't just pick up brushing their teeth by osmosis. Teach them to brush their teeth. Teach them to have good habits of hygiene. Teach them to, to pick up their rooms. Uh, teach them to dress uh, in, a, in a way that approximates uh, normality. Uh, teach them to, to take care of themselves. Teach them to be kind to their siblings. Teach, 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 teach. And in that home, if a parent says, well, I just love them too much to correct them, then I promise you what you're raising in that home are hellions. I saw a meme the other day that said, remember those children in the, in the, in the grocery store who were pitching tantrums and their parents wouldn't do anything to correct them? You wonder what happened to them? They've grown up. They're marching in the streets now. They're burning buildings. They're punching people. You raise hellions if you don't correct your children. School's the same way. All these government things tying the hands of our teachers and administrators behind their back. I had a principal in elementary school, Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin was about this tall. Maybe. And I got summoned to his office one day, and it only took one time to go to Mr. Martin's office. And he bent me over. In elementary school, I was about as tall as he was. He bent me over. He grabbed me by the back of my shirt. He had a paddle. He lifted me off the ground with his paddle. I wept like a baby. You know how many times I went to Mr. Martin's office after that? Zero. You know how many times I went to the principal's office in junior high school? Zero. <laughs> High school, zero. Thank God for Mr. Martin. Well, the church is no different. We don't use paddles, but God has a prescription in his word to help, to love wayward members. We've been looking at that. So formative and, correct, and, and corrective uh, discipline, positive instruction, uh, redemptive correction. And so we've, we've walked through these things with you. I just want to remind you when it comes to uh, section 6.5 on the discipline of members and our bylaws that uh, we talked about the necessity of the discipline of members. We cited 11 reasons. I suggested to you that uh, the purpose, I mean, the purpose of, of discipline, 11 reasons, very comprehensive. Go back and read it if you, if you, if you need to. It's excellent. We talked about the necessity of the discipline. We talked about four reasons, and particularly number three brings us to this time. When biblical standards are violated by those living scandalous lives, the sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. When you come to a time like this, this is not a matter that's just inconvenient for us or that causes us to go, 
Mm -mm -mm. The soul of this individual is at stake. We'll read you a verse at the end in Ezekiel that tells you how serious it is for us. We talked about the administration of this, that, that it would take, could take different forms, private or public admonition, rebu reproving, rebuking, convincing, corrective discipline where you come to make the application when all other attempts have failed. We told you that the goal of church discipline is always to bring about genuine repentance and complete restoration to fellowship of the member who is under discipline. It's never about kicking somebody out. It's never about washing our hands of them. It's never about looking down on them and saying, how could you do something like that? Here's the truth, folks. If we know our own hearts, we're all, we're all culpable. We're all dealing with a, a tinderbox of iniquity if we don't pour the oil of grace on it continually and keep it soaked with that. We told you that discipline must be exercised in a firm way when a, when a member of the church is in need of discipline that we should follow a process. And that's what I want to talk about today when we wrap this up. And this is all from our bylaws. The process upon firsthand knowledge of sin by a member of the body of Christ, we reprove that person. We did that. We did that. We discovered that. I confronted the individual and reproved her, rebuked her, pled with her to repent, repent and not continue in sin. The good news is if when you do that, and you better do that, better be willing to do that if you love somebody, if they listen and repent, the scripture says you've won that person. Look at Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Luke 17, 3. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. That's the, that's the flow of the gospel. The gospel is, is not complicated, folks. It is continue, getting up daily, being willing to repent of my sin when I discover it. Whether I discover it in my own personal study, whether I discover it because someone loves me enough to come to me and point it out, whether I discover it because the Holy Spirit simply pricks me within my conscience to bring it to pass. Repent. Repent. Practicing repentance. We get up every day, we practice forgiveness. Someone has sinned against us, we've got an option. We can stew over it, we can cultivate an angry, bitter spirit, which hurts us, or we can practice the, what I call the, the, uh, the attitude, an attitudinal forgiveness until we can confront the person, call them to repent, and when they, when they repent, then we have formal forgiveness, and, and there's no, there's, the, the devil should not be able to slide a sheet of notebook paper between two Christians who are practicing repentance and forgiveness, and in faith, a deepening of our faith in Jesus Christ, and a, a greater understanding of how much, what he paid for us when he paid the price of our sins. That's the gospel. That's the Christian life lived out. Secondly, if he or she continues in sin, in other words, you've, you've confronted them, and they've rebuffed you. If they continue in sin, reprove him or her with two or three witnesses. If he or she's listening and, and repents, then you've won that person. Matthew 18, 16. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. That's a biblical principle. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything is established. In other words, made right. So they may not receive you. And so the idea is that you take two or three witnesses, ideally people that would have this person's ear. Not two or three people who are, here's what happens, folks, and you know this. Someone sins against you, then you get on the phone, call four or five of your friends and tell them how terrible this person is. That's sinning against that individual, it's sinning against the process. It's, it's trampling underfoot the revealed will of God. Ideally, you take someone with, with you who has their ear and sit down and make the, make the appeal again. This is tedious. But if you're looking for easy, you shouldn't have signed up for Christianity. Ask our brothers and sisters in Sudan. So you go. You plead again. You may not answer the door. You determine... Well, should we try again? You use text, Instagram, 
Twitter, I don't know, email. I know email's archaic, but you can still use it. A letter typed or written to reach out and try to get a meeting. But if you're rebuffed and you're rebuffed, tragic. But perhaps the two or three witnesses may get in the ear. Maybe the individual thought it easy enough to brush off one person. But a small delegation coming out of concern for the glory of God in the gospel. And the soul of that individual may get a hearing. I'll tell you a story about myself. Years ago, and i got to do this quickly, two deacons who loved me dearly, I knew they did. They stood with us through thick and thin at, at the Reformation underway at First Baptist Clinton, came to me and said, Preacher, we want to talk to you about something. There was a couple in the church. Uh, she was just a high school English teacher. He worked for LSU Extension in Baton Rouge. And uh, they would intentionally come in late every Sunday in this little church building we had, you had a belfry over in this corner, bell tower, and you had these big wooden, the thing was built in 1871, big wooden doors, so they would stick. And so when you came in them, you could, you could hit them and boom! Everybody knew somebody was coming through the door, unless you, unless you purposefully eased them open. Every Sunday when they would come, boom! She'd come through the door. She would grab a, I think it's Home Life magazine. You used to be a Home Life magazine? It used to be a magazine. Pick up a copy of that and go sit down. And she would hold the Home Life magazine up to let me know I'm here, but I'm not listening to you. Sweet lady. Well, I didn't know this, but the deacon said, Pastor, we can tell... Your ears turn red. Her name was Mary. When Mary and her husband come through the door. And we think you're letting her get to you. And we just want to caution you. Now, I would love to tell you that I said, Brethren, I love you for coming to me and telling me that. That you love me that much. That's not what I did on a Wednesday night after prayer meeting. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I can't believe you would come to me when you haven't been to her to call her to act like a human being. These guys were devastated. They had dared in their understanding of Matthew 18, 15 to come to me. I rebuffed them. Well, Parsonage was about, I don't know, carrying 100, 150 yards from the church facility. So I'm, they go, I can, I mean, they, they go there, huh? they just walk away. And I'm heading home. And the Holy Spirit of God ate my lunch. We didn't have cell phones, couldn't text, couldn't Instagram with a little funny face on it. Gee, I'm sorry, no. I called them, both of them when I got home. I said, brother, forgive me. I sinned against you by not receiving your expression, your, your reproof, really, your rebuke of me. Forgive me. You see, that's what happens when you know the Lord. <laughs> you can't stand to be at odds with another brother or sister in Christ. And when that's not happening, we have every reason to wonder, are we even dealing with a real believer? And you don't know. B.H. Carroll in his commentary on 1 Corinthians on chapter 5 said, it comes at some point where you take the person who said he or she was a sheep and you take them out of the sheepfold, the safety of that, and you turn them loose. Said if they, if they run back to the sheepfold and bleat and bleat and bleat, begging to be let back in, then you have affected the purpose of church discipline, but if they turn and run and jump into a mud puddle, you know you were not dealing with a sheep. And you don't know that till you get to the point you need to come to. You hope and pray at every point that they hear and repent and you can begin the process of restoration. Third, if he or she continues in sin, reprove him or her before the church. That's when the church gets involved. Doesn't matter if it was, if it was a private matter initially. 
It becomes a public matter not because the church is made up of gossips, but because the person is recalcitrant and refuses to receive biblical admonition. If he or she listens and repents, listens to the church, so the church sends out a correspondence, which has happened for this individual, pleading with, for repentance, then we've won them. Matthew 18, 17. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. How are we supposed to treat Gentiles and tax collectors? We pray for them that they might be saved. But we don't pretend that they're our brothers or sisters in Christ. We don't look down our noses at them. We love them, but we're loving them with a view to see them one to Christ. 1 Timothy 5.20, As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all. Whether they are here to be rebuked or whether the rebuke goes in the presence of all without them. So that the rest may stand in fear so that all of us may realize this is serious business. Now, look, you can join a church. I, I calculated it one time with f folks that are having church service on Friday night and then on Saturday evening and then several times across the day Sunday. If we got real energetic, you and I could be members of about six or eight different churches in this town in one weekend, and nobody would know that we're members of other churches. That's how cheaply and lightly membership is taken in most of the places in this area. Can't do that here. We have a process. Membership means something. We use the term meaningful membership. So if this person continues in sin, then you come to excommunicate this person. The word excommunicate is not a Catholic term. I, I, I thought it was growing up. I had some Catholic friends who wouldn't, I think, what was it? They, they ate fish on Friday and they... They went to catechism, which I thought must be a Catholic thing. And come to find out, it's just a Greek word, catecheo, which means to instruct. And they excommunicated people. It's not a Catholic word. It's a word that means to remove from membership. Not remove from physical presence, but remove from the rights and privileges of membership. You hope in the process there that they repent. So Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 5, you to deliver this one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Excommunicating a person, communicating to them you are no longer a member of this congregation is handing them over to Satan. I know, I'm not naive. Again, that same person being removed from membership could go join the same six, seven, eight churches if they had the energy on Friday, Saturday, Friday night, Saturday night, and all day Sunday, except for this that if we find out a church receives a member under discipline here, we communicate to them and say, you cannot have that person be a member. We are in the process of recovering them by God's biblical design. Don't interrupt that. Don't undermine it. Then it's on their conscience whether they do or not. 1 Timothy 1.20, Paul says of Hymenaeus and Alexander, I've handed over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. You don't hand one over to Satan because you want to see him go to hell. You hand one over to Satan because Satan's God's tool to trouble them and, and, and plague them until they repent and return to the Lord and to the Lord's people. 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note, mark that person. Take note of that person having nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. The point is that they may come to be ashamed that they've conducted themselves, that the Lord may use the means we employ to provoke them to be shameful and repent in return. Do not regard him as an enemy, see, but warn him as a brother. What is excommunication? Well, I want to read this to you real quickly because this, I think J.I. Packer wrote this so we understand the term. To be excommunicated from the church of Christ is a dreadful thing. Yet there's only one sin so serious that it warrants dismissal from the body of Christ. That sin is the sin of impenitence. The process unwilling to repent along the way. There are multitudes, there are multitude of sins serious enough to require church discipline. However, since church discipline is a multi-step process with excommunication being the final step, the only sin that can bring us to that step is the refusal to repent of the sin that initiated the process in the first place. Excommunication is the most extreme disciplinary measure of the church. 
It entails excluding the unrepentant sinner from communion from the Lord's table with the faithful. The doctrine derives from Jesus' teaching on binding and loosing in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18 and John 20. The responsibility for discipline was given to the church. The passage in Matthew 18 lists three steps. We've already talked about those. It should be noted that excommunication is never to be performed with a sense of retribution. The entire process, up to and including excommunication, is a form of discipline designed to bring the unrepentant person back into the fold. At the point of excommunication, the guilty party is handed over to the devil. The intent is not to punish, but to awaken the guilty party to his sin. John Calvin said this, that church discipline is, quote, the best help to sound doctrine, order, and unity. So, as we go through our process spelled out in our bylaws, if he or she continues in sin, turn away from him or her. Romans 16, 17 to 19. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause division and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, we command you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you've received from us, in other words, the doctrines. If that person rep- listens and repents at that point, at the point of excommunication, then they've won. They've been one. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 2. We talked about this earlier, verses 5 to 8. Paul wrote 1 uh, 1 Corinthians in chapter 5, said, I've already handed the one over to Satan. I've already judged him. You do the same. Well, he writes 2 Corinthians, and apparently the person, the church did just what was exhorted by Paul, and the person repented. Listen to 2 Corinthians 2, 5 to 8. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it, Not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. That's what you should be feeling. If we love one another, no, we don't care. If we just come to church and don't care, you know, come see, come saw. But if we love one another, then a person living in scandalous ways is hurtful to us. And now we're not talking about the snowflake, you've hurt my feelings. It's painful to us. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So the majority voted to do the very thing. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him. Now, he's been shamed. He's repented. Or or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow if the church doesn't reach out to, continue to reach out to, continue to pray for. And we've sinned against the person that we have taken action for scandalous sin. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. That's the process. If he or she continues in sin, in other words, impenitence continues to flow. And that's where we are right now. The church has fulfilled its responsibilities before God. Listen to Ezekiel 33, and I close with this. Verses 7 to 9. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, that's what we've been looking at. This is not Bill Askell's ideas. This is a word from the mouth of God, captured very well, I think, in our Constitution and bylaws. You shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die. And you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn away from his way. That wicked person shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn away from his way, and he does not turn away from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. You see how seriously God takes this? This is not trifling with God. I had a pastor say to somebody decades ago now, oh, you know, I just, I'd have to love you like a parent to discipline you. And I just don't know that as a pastor I've gotten there yet that I love you. What, what, what nonsense. What tripe. 
A holy God looks upon his churches. Is it any wonder? I told you a couple weeks ago, John Dagg said when, when corrective discipline leaves a church, the Spirit of Christ goes with it. Is it any wonder churches are so powerless today? The culture esteems us so lightly. No, I'm trying to help myself and you deliver your soul in this matter as we attempt as a congregation to deliver her soul as well. So, quickly, some answers. Yes, they are encouraged to continue or begin to attend all of our gatherings. An excommunicated person, excommunicated person is expected to be in Sunday school, morning worship, evening study, Wednesday prayer. Only people, by the way, who, who are not permitted to attend any of those times are people who we have determined would be a danger to our children or our adults or who would be disruptive. That's the only two categories of people who are forbidden to attend Sunday school, worship, study at night, prayer at midweek. Everyone else is expected to be there. That's what our Constitution and bylaws says. They're stated meetings, and the members who, who agreed to that have said, you can count on us to be there. So the excommunicated person is expected to be there. No, they may not participate in the Lord's Supper, congregational voting, or leadership roles in the life of the church. No. We would have to, if, the, if an excommunicated person is sitting among us, we would withhold the Lord's Supper from that person, again, as a way to bring redemptive correction to them, to let them know we, we see you differently than we see one another. Third, all encounters with the excommunicated person should be evangelistic in nature, as opposed to one of Christian fellowship, as if you're carrying on as if nothing's wrong. My daughter knows when I talk with her, I will evangelize her. That's why she has less and less interest in talking to me. But it's going to happen nonetheless. And then yes, they'll be received back into membership when they have demonstrated real repentance, a genuine sorrow for sin, and a demonstrable turning away from it, as well as returning to the life of the church. I would hope going through these things the last three weeks, that it's, it's also been a time, it certainly has for me, of a personal examination of my own life. Am I living in vital union with Christ? Am I faithful to his church? You will, you will not find one, where in the, one place in the scripture where it says Jesus Christ died for an individual. But I can show you where he died for his church. He laid down his life for his sheep, for his friends. There's categories. The categories are those who follow him. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. An examination time when a church has to come to this. If you have questions, please seek me out. I, don't, I want to hear from you. I don't want to, anyone to be confused. But I think the scripture is clear, and I think we've tried to make it clear, and I think our Constitution and bylaws are very clear in terms of what must be done when an individual moves into the arena of scandalous living. And I hope you'll pray. And I hope as you have occasion to reach out, that you'll reach out and assure this person, we miss you, we love you, we want to see you back. What can I do to help with that? Why is this so important? Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is upon this place. We preach a crucified and risen Savior who died for sin, not so that we could continue to live in sin, who died to rescue us. His very name, Jesus, for he shall save his people, Joseph was told, out of their sin. There's no reason to believe that a person wallowing in his sin has ever been saved. And so it's evangelistic, finally, to help this person be delivered from the, from the delusion, 
that it's okay between them and God because it's not. Have you followed Christ? Are you trusting Christ? Are you living in obedience to Christ? I pray that you are. Let's bow. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we come to today, Lord, we're frail creatures of dust. None of us is perfect, but thank God that's not the requirement. There's only one who's ever been perfect, and we look to him today, the perfect Son of God, as our substitute, as our mediator, as our teacher, as our prophet, priest, and king. And so help us soberly to consider our responsibility to rescue this one who is perishing, to snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. And when you look at us, Lord, and look at our hands, may we not be found with bloody hands in this matter. Help us be faithful as we come next week. I pray in the meantime that you would do what only you can do, and that is to change this person's heart, radically change her heart. Rescue her. Save her. Really save her by your grace. And Father, if anyone here today is living under the delusion of a false profession of faith, I pray that your spirit would come and take the gospel of grace and shake them until there's nothing left to hold, nothing left to hold on to except the cross of Christ. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing to be dismissed. And Brother Barry is going to come after just a brief.